to be a leading direct man with your masculine energy, very sexual. You are willing to take her hand. You are willing to kiss her when you look in the eyes and you're not waiting for a green permission slip. Or maybe the reason why I'm so heavily dependent upon the validation of females is because at some point in my life, I was told that I was unworthy. That the more you strive and the more you try to bring the most amazing, beautiful woman into your life, the further you get away from it. For the woman you are looking for will show up when you become the man that she was looking for. So on a recent podcast, BDP149, Advice for the Numb, Hurt and Unloved, I received a comment from a curious boy who says, I feel like a failure, man. I can't get any girl. Well, you're not a failure. You're just disconnected. It's not that you can't get any girl because you are insufficient and unworthy as a human being, but it's because you can't get yourself. What I sense here is an extreme self-disconnection. If or if I were to give you all the most attractive women in the world, in fact, let me give you everything that you want. If I was to give you all the money, all the social stature, uh, the position in the career, and the adulation from your friends and family and society at large, that would surely not plug the hole within yourself. What I'm sensing from you here, curious boy, is that you are pursuing a lifetime of dissatisfaction. As you chase that outside of yourself, uh, you end up with wet feet. Wet feet because the cup you had tried to fill had no bottom as the cup laughs back at you. I resonate and I understand that if you're in a position in life where you feel dejected because maybe you have been rejected or because you feel just as a overall malaise in your general day that you are unworthy or unaccepted or unattractive as a human being. You know, I have many clients that are like this. Many people that come into the world of social dynamics come from this pain point of feeling like they're just not enough, whether it's because back in their childhood, right, they were traumatized, led to believe that they inherently were not enough, they had to be fixed, they were broken, better not step out of line, better not express yourself better not express your full capacity as a human being, better not share that love, peace, and joy for someone at some time had disconnected you from that. And so now you've ever learned to, at some point, at some point throughout your life, but very much likely stemming from back in those early years, you learn to form this protection mechanism, this coping mechanism in which that you walk throughout your days right, shelling up, shelling up and walking a tight line, a tight, narrow line in which that the energy within you is blocked and you have all these restrictions within you. And so I would, I would highly conjecture that you probably don't smile that much. You probably don't look people in the eyes that much. It'd be interesting to see how much you smile at yourself, how much you look at yourself in the eyes. A beautiful relationship of inner to outer, all is one. Now we look at your relationships and your relationship status. You know, I'm going to conjecture that you're maybe mid, early to mid 20s. No older than mid-20s, I would say, just purely based on your username, but also because of the way that you're speaking. It's very indicative and reflective of someone in a younger age scape in which that you feel like your entire self-worth is based on the fact of whether you have an attractive woman in your life or not. I would like to read you out actually a quote. So this is a direct transcript from a voice message, a very long voice message that my client sent me. I'm just going to read out this bit for you here now, Mr. Curious. My client says, I see that what I really want is just to reconnect with myself. I don't even need girls that bad. I love making other people happy, but in terms of what this journey is about, if I could really reconnect with myself and be in a place where I love myself, no matter what's happening, no matter where I am, I do think that life would become such an adventure and I'd have the energy to love and everything to really get into an interaction and give somebody so much energy and love, excitement, and give those positive emotions to them. Now let's contrast to your comment. I feel like I'm a failure, man. I can't get any girl. And so you see a dividing line in the psychology between you and my client. My client has come to a small realization, yet to see how large it will manifest. He's still in the beginning of his journey, but realization no less in which that this is not about the people that I'm getting. This is about who I'm becoming. The type of person that can self-generate love, that can give positive emotions, the excitement, that can reconnect with myself fundamentally. And by reconnecting with myself, I will deal out the best experience to the people I engage with. By reconnecting with myself, he will 
synchronize all aspects of his temple from purpose, physical, mental to social development, transcended by an inner knowing, your true nature, your true essence, which goes well beyond your name and date of birth and your occupation, which goes well beyond the holdings within your house, within your financial bank account. It goes well, well, well sourced into the eternal part of you, whether you would like to label that with a label, you know, whether you're a Christian, Muslim, a Taoist, it doesn't really matter. But before we get too deep into the philosophy of things, let's look for a little bit later on this podcast. At least he's come to a realization in which that, well, this journey cannot be about transacting on people. The journey of understanding who you are and improving not only the external measure of your life, but most importantly, the internal measure has to be derived from that in which that I pursue the development of supreme excellence. Supreme excellence, not in contrast to anyone else, but based on myself. Right? You're not here to compare yourself to anyone else. The journey will always be your journey. No one is starting from an equal standpoint. Life is not equal. Society is not equal. No matter how much the progressive woke leftists will try to make you believe, and I'm, I don't take a side on left versus right. I think it's silly. I think these names are silly. I think you should weigh each potential issue based on its own merit. You don't fall into these tribal camps. But anyways, if you do, when you do see people that fall into that, particularly those that fall on the far left progressive side of things, in which that we need to make things equal. We need to relegate everyone's brilliance down to an equal playing field so that everyone gets a fair shot in life. Well, that's not life. That's not life. Surely you know this curious boy. Surely all of us know this that have been through the world of social dynamics. I don't know what type of level of social training that you have. I don't know if you've never gone up to a random person and given them direct intent. You know, let's talk about some principles here. Let's, we're going to get very granular in today's podcast about social dynamics because I will lay out a remedy plan. I'm no, I'm, the beginning of this podcast has been pretty high level, pretty macro level, pretty intense thinking, but we will get to some game plans, what I would recommend for someone like you. And maybe we're going to start to fall into that now as I'm sensing the moment. But what I was purely trying to go on there was that I don't know what your level of social training is, but at the bare minimum, if you don't have the capacity to go out there on any given day, on any given night, go up to five random strangers, just five, and you just give them pure love. You know, excuse me, miss. I just saw you walking by and I know this is really random, but I just wanted to wish you a great life. My name is Adam. You let it sit. You absorb their response. You look deep into their eyes, smiling into their eyes with yours. You don't need anything from her. You don't need her to respond positively. Great if she does. If she responds negatively, that's fine as well. She's in her own little bubble there. And this is the bedrock. This is the foundation of where social training really begins because what is social training? What is social dynamics? It's learning to understand who you are in relation to others. It's learning to honor the dance of masculine to feminine energy. It's learning to give the best of yourself to another so that they may enjoy the best experience possible, the best human experience possible. That's what social dynamics is. So you have a simultaneous process of not only illuminating who you are, including the worst of yourself, because surely if you don't have the capacity to go out to five random people right now, Right now, like as soon as this podcast is done, put this podcast down, go out into your local mall, go out into your local night strip, and you just go up to five random people. Don't take an hour. Don't take five hours to do it. If you're doing it well, you should be able to do it within anywhere, maximum 10 minutes, depending on how long your conversations will go. But a lot of the times, especially if you're an absolute beginner, right? You, when I said before that, you know, sit, let them respond, smile into their eyes, and it's probably going to end there. But that's okay. Every now and again, though, you might see someone who was really receptive, someone who was actually hoping another human being would come up to them and show them some humanity. The thing about what I refer to as this process, I call it the give loves. It's what I give to all my clients, depending on different stages of their journey, actually. Some of my clients that have actually traversed the clock face of social dynamics, which is at the beginning, for those that don't know, it's basically the way that I form a rubric around the development in terms of social training. Clock face, imagine a clock face, 12 to 12, all the way around. Top of the clock face, first quartile, 12 to 3 o'clock, unconscious incompetence. Now, you don't even know what you don't even know. You're mostly just learning to overcome yourself. Then 3 to 6, in which that now you are consciously incompetent. Now you know how much you suck and you're actively working to improve it, but it's not working. Like it's a real grind. Then from 6 to 9, consciously competent. Now I know what to do and I can do it. Now, it still requires conscious effort, still requires quite a bit of, quite a bit of effort to do it. But at least I'm having positive outcomes. 
because I can see that I'm actually getting a handle on this. And then finally, the final quartile, nine to 12, unconscious competence. Now you're so good that you don't even know how good you are because there is no knowing anymore. It's unconscious. There is no effort. As Lao Tzu said in the data chain 2,500 years ago, the down never acts, yet leaves nothing undone. This podcast is brought to you by BoldDojo.com, where you can book one-on-one coaching with myself in order to create action plans, overcome limiting beliefs, destroy negative self-perceptions, and egoic attachments. Have a listening ear to the trials of your life, helping you to move forward. You can also sign up for the free weekly email newsletter, The Bold Sip. It's just a quick sip of social dynamics and anything I'm exploring on Fridays. Just go to BoldDojo.com, sign that up. You can also hit up the free resources of wisdom, where I drop my favorite books, movies, quotes, anime, documentaries, music, all of that all at boldojo.com. And if you would like to help support this podcast, you can donate anything that you wish through the PayPal link, paypal.me forward slash A-D-A-M-O-O-I. Link is down below in the description, or you can also donate directly through the website, also linked down in the description. Anything that you guys do donate is always extremely appreciated and just goes back to helping support the show and what I do here. So thank you very much. And if you do get anything from this piece of content, please let me know in a comment down below. I'll do my best to get back to you as soon as possible. And also please drop a thumbs up on the video. It just helps the YouTube algorithm, helps send out the video to more people in the community. And if you find that you resonated, share over a friend who you think would resonate as well. Let's get into today's show. I'm assuming right now, Mr. Curious Boy, you're somewhere between 12 to 3. You're likely unconsciously incompetent. But the reason why I went to this whole clock face example was because I have some clients that have traversed the clock face all the way through to conscious competence, but then hit a snag. Because mostly, in order to get from being unconsciously incompetent all the way through to conscious competence, that's mostly social skill training. And that's where we're going on in this, in which I said to you, what is social dynamics? What is social skill? So social dynamics, and if we're looking at the training of it, breaks down to two components. Component one, social skill. Component two, emotional skill. The beginning of the journey, which is going up the mountain, is very much training social skill. The mechanics, the cogs. Intent. Eye contact. Vocal tonality, pitch, projection, pacing, vocals, body language, right? Control, master of your body, at ease with it, the ability to communicate messages through your body language. Intent, eye contact, vocal tonality, body language, vibe, final one there, vibration, your overall vibration, which is really your set point, your demeanor, your perspective towards life. The intangible, when someone says, I'm chilling tonight, what the hell does that mean? It means I'm vibing. That's my vibe. I'm chilling. I'm feeling pretty amped up. I'm feeling pretty pumped. You be pumped. What does that mean? That means that that's my vibe. I'm feeling very, feel pretty sensual. Pretty feeling pretty sexual tonight. I want to connect very sexually with her tonight. What does that mean? It's my vibration. It doesn't really mean anything. It's just a very elusive way of describing the overall feeling within me. The vibration. So those five key components right there: intent, eyes, vocals, body, vibration. That would make up and you would train those as social skills. You can train all of those components. And that would, there's obviously a plethora of components within each individual component. So when we, like I said before, with vocals, there's the, the pitch, the tonality, the pacing, the space, the silence, et cetera, that all com- combine into vocals and you can train all those. That's what social skill is, right? And the ability, so that's what social skill is in terms of you being able to execute that but then in being able to receive that is just as much a part of a social skill. So when I talk about social skill, it's not just about the ability to execute social skills. It's about the ability to receive them as well, receive and perceive. Because you have, we will find some people in which that, if they have not completed their training, have an imbalance between their ability to execute and receive. I've seen this with guys actually in which that they might be very good at talking, but very poor at listening. Very good at doing very poor at being. Anyways, putting that to the side. I know we're going for tangents here, but I said we would get granular, so we're getting granular here. Saddle up. So that described the second one portion, the first half of the pie, going up the mountain of training social dra- dynamics and social skills, socializing. Then you have the other half, which is emotional skill, which is coming down the mountain, which is really, if on the clock face, is going from the beginning of conscious competence at the bottom of that clock face, six o'clock, to completing the journey. In order to complete the journey, you actually have to let go of what brought you up there. In order to finish this mountain, you're going to have to come back down. And what that means is developing a bedrock of emotional strength, emotional confidence, 
an unwavering belief in oneself that no matter what the feedback is from the environment, from the people within the environment, it will not affect my self-worth. You should not destroy your sense of self-worth because you are in pursuit, in pursuit of a best experience in which that maybe you did not live up to. What I'm saying there is that one does not have to destroy their sense of self-worth just because they are working on social skills and social dynamics. Now, um, that particular topic that I just went into is very, you, it, I'm just realizing that doesn't really, it's a bit of an off tangent, it's a bit of a shoot off from the main point I want to go on. But the reason why that came up is because it's something I'm working with a particular client with right now in which that, who actually has pretty good social skill, but his emotional skill is absolutely abysmal. And what I'm trying to say to him is that, you know, just because you're working on social skills doesn't mean you have to destroy your sense of self-worth. That really is the emotional skill. So let's bring it back here to the main topic when we're talking about what emotional skill is, right? Very simply, it's your ability to maintain a harmonious emotional state in the face of external feedback, right? Whether you're in the club, whether you're out on the mall, whether you got a girl who loves you, a girl that doesn't love you, a man who loves you, a man who doesn't love you, right? This is, and this is the thing that you get from me, which is that when we're talking about social dynamics, um, for the most part, talking about a sexually polarized interaction between a masculine and a feminine, but it doesn't have to be. Right? Social dynamics applies to everyone and everything you do in your life. Last night, I was with my girlfriend, and we were walking. We were working through some absolute deep chop, deep, deep chop on some very powerful, meaningful, potentially catastrophic relationships breaking down in her life. Nothing to do with me, but with other members of her life, of her fam, uh, of her family, and other relations, and. That was some real social dynamics. That was some legitimate social dynamics that we were going through there. The way that you talk to your mom, the way that you talk to your brothers, the way that you engage with your boss, people at work. Like social dynamics is everything. Dynamic being too social, the way that human beings interact, right? This is what we're looking at here. So you got two things here. Social skill, emotional skill. You put this together. I have absolutely no idea why we went into that full explanation, but I know where we were roughly or quite largely in this podcast, which was, I need you to be able to go out and I think you need you to be able to go out into the mall, into a night strip and just be able to give love to five people. Maybe that's why I went into this was because that is, ah, that's why now I remember why, because it doesn't really matter how developed you get in social skill on the, on that first half of the temple. If you don't have that self-worth, that acceptance, that love, that harmony within yourself, the ability to harness your ego for meaningful work, then it doesn't matter how awesome your social skills are. And why? Because awesome social skills will bring a girl into your life. Make no mistake, you get really good at conveying intent, eye contact, vocals, body, vibration. A girl will be attracted to you, no doubt. But will she stay? Let me ask you, curious boy, because I'm curious. Is it enough just for you to get a girl? Is getting the girl the be or end or? What's said for her ability to stay? Her desire to build a life with you, to create a relationship, to create a relationship that would spur on to you guys co creating a atmosphere, a environment in which that you would foster children, that you'd bring forth life together. You know, as raw as the rain that drops outside my door right now, to feel so deeply intertwined and interconnected with another human being in which that you would want to bring life into it from both of you, feeling the flow of life between you and her on this eternal thread that we walk as life, as human beings. I take you down this little pathway, this little story, this little illustration here because it seems that your concept for what you are worthy of and what you think your happiness will be realized by is very shallow. Just getting the girl. It also, you know, it's not inherent that that is a mindset of someone who's younger in life, but it is very reflective. You know, I'm not saying that a 30-year-old or a 40-year-old wouldn't have that mindset. It's definitely possible. But let's just presume that you are, for like for the benefit of the doubt here, let's presume you are somewhere between 18 to 24 and you have this mindset. Contrast 
your mindset versus my client who's trying to reconnect with himself. Contrast your mindset with what I just said about getting the girl is maybe the first 10% if you're going to take that mindset, which I would never encourage. You know, what I would encourage is getting yourself. Are you a failure because you can't get any girl? No. You're just disconnected from yourself. So that is what would tie me in and that's where it ties both of us to this idea of that even if you were to be so good socially and let's say you even bolstered yourself with ridiculous financial uh, support in which that you were very well off and you had great business connections and you could pay for anything and no money was no object and you know you dress up real fancy and drive real fancy and you go stay in real fancy condos in the Bahamas and you know maybe you came across a woman who was searching for that Maybe you came across them because there is a market. There's definitely a market for women that, you know, as we were coined them as gold diggers in which that they're not working girls. Maybe they had been working girls in another time, but they don't, they don't want to lift a finger. They want to transact on their physical appearance. That is their number one ticket, primary value as a human being. And they will use that. They will forsake themselves, their spiritual connection between another them, between them and another human being and go, well, I'm here for the financial stimulus. And they will seek out men like this. And I, I'm always been very careful in these podcasts to honor that, to be truthful in that, in which that, yes. In fact, I know, I've known girls like this. I've known several girls like this that are, as I refer to as professional hot girls, and it's not indicative that professional hot girls are all gold diggers at the same time. It's definitely not the case. You know, professional hot girls are just girls that get paid for the based purely on their looks. What are we talking about? Models, escorts, uh, prostitutes, strippers. Yeah. You get the idea. Professional hot girls. Not all of them have forsaken themselves to the point in which that they will sleep with a man purely for the $5,000, $6,000 monthly allowance that they get from him. And they don't have to do anything. They don't have to work. But it definitely exists. So what I'm, the reason why I'm painting this is because you could go down that path, Mr. Curious Boy. You could dedicate all of your psychological energy to getting as much money as you possibly can, just peacocking yourself up, priming yourself up to look the part, to facade the part, to veil the part of being a successful man. Because essentially that's what those men are doing is that they are masking, or masking with this perception of success. And that is what is going to attract women. And with power as well, with you know, that old saying, with money comes power, and that money is powerful. I don't deny any of these things. There exists a market of women for that. But is that the woman that you want? Is that the woman that you want? Maybe right now you think it is because you're saying that I can't get any girl. Well, at least let me try that and then I'll get it. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to argue with that. If you want to go down the path of chasing such external stimulation and validation to the point of which that you lose who you are, because that is the pathway, my friend. While it is not my position to tell you what path to take in life, I can definitely point out for you where it's likely to head. So let's take a, a, a version A of you versus version B. Version A being that, okay, well, I'm going to forsake myself. I'm going to ignore this self-disconnection that makes me feel like I'm a failure because I can't get any girl. And I'm going to seek to remedy that by just doing everything that I can based on what I see in society about how it is to get a girl. So- I dress myself up real good, get as much money as I possibly can, go to all the, the hottest pumping clubs in, in, in my city, maybe move to a different city like Vegas or Melbourne or Sydney or whatever. And I'll just, I'll just every single day of my life, I'll just dedicate myself to the true pursuit, the one pursuit. I'm not sure how true it is, but it's definitely one pursuit. Maybe it's, maybe it's true in its oneness of your pursuit of just getting a sexy woman in my life. Right? No matter what quality of spirit she has, it does not matter. All that matters is that I have her in my life because then I will be successful. So you play that out, you play that out, and maybe you have a lot of fun. Maybe version A of you has a lot of fun doing that. You know, it's a fucking grind because however you went to go about getting your cheddar, how you went to go about greasing your wheels with that dollar, then it's a absolute grind. But then maybe you got into the right connections, you met the right people, you met the right bouncers and the right club promoters, and then you found yourself the girls that hang around with them because those are typically the type of girls that are looking to, you know, dig for a little gold. Uh, then They know that's where the rich boys go, so they go there. And then you find yourself a girl. Just as lost as you. But you two don't see that. All you two see is this transactional relationship is that I give him sex. I hang off his arm at family functions. 
uh, work functions, you know, and that makes him feel good. I don't really love him though. I don't. I definitely don't want to have kids with him. I don't think I even want to have kids. I don't think I'll ever love anyone because I'm so disconnected inside. But hang on, at least he pays me. As long as he pays me, because right now I have no other options. Right, this is all I've got. I've got my ass, got my tits, got my straightened hair, my fake eyelashes, and that's it. So, I'm going to use this to the best of my ability. Cool. And I found a guy here who is so disconnected from himself that he was willing to make this trade. He gives me money, I give him sex. Done. He gives me money, I give him social validation. Done. He gives me money, I make him feel like a man. Done. So you guys have a lot of fun through this. This works until it works. I should say it works until it doesn't work. But at what point, Curious Boy, does it not work? What would be the giant nail in the coffin or the final splitting hair on this camel's back that would force the beast to finally die? Well, I would conjecture that it would be the moment in which that you realize you had forsaken yourself to the point of almost no return. I would conjecture it would happen in a moment where maybe you just got done having sex with this woman you've been paying that you just woke up and realized that, well, she wasn't really enjoying it. She wasn't even present. She's probably thinking about someone else. Like I get no love from her. I get no love. She lets me penetrate her, but I get no love. And it was just on a, on a quiet morning where you just realized this as she rolled over and you know, she went to go clean herself off after you had done your business. And then this existential question arises in your mind of, who am I? Who am I? That question, I feel like there was a, a guy on a podcast who once asked me that, who once directed me towards that self-connection within. Who am I? And you start to play with this question. Maybe you ignore it for the rest of that morning you know, brush it off. Yeah, maybe it was just because she was in a shitty mood. I was like drunk from the last night or something. Okay, okay. Then you go about your day and you go to the gym and, you know, you, you go do your, do your business and then maybe it's just later that evening. It just hits you again. Who am I? Am I successful? Because it surely doesn't feel like it. I thought being successful would feel really good. Well, I guess it meant, and I guess it was based on what you thought being successful meant. Did you think that having a beautiful woman on your arm and having all this money and having all this social stature and validation, that would make you successful? Hmm. Hmm. If not, what does make a human being successful? What would be the antidote to your feeling of failureness right now? Would it be in the accounting of all the external measure you have accumulated in your life? When you walk down the street and you see a man driving a latest AMG Mercedes and you see him with this primmed up model magazine looking woman walking on his arm, right? he's wearing his flashy Armani suit, is that a success for you? What if he was a horrible human being? What if inside, even if he wasn't a horrible human being, but what if he felt horrible inside? You know, that's something that you wouldn't know unless you really got to know him. You know, the silent tears that people carry within their hearts. That's not something you get to see or hear. You know, you don't hear about, particularly when you're looking at Instagram and you're looking at social media, you see these perfectly curated photos, you, these videos in which that they are snapshots of a window, of a moment in time. Yet you didn't see the other 23 hours and 59 minutes of that person's day. You didn't see what it was like when they, when the woman that you saw on that Instagram photo that you so highly prize, and I wish I could just get that girl, wish I could get that girl. You don't see that when she goes to bed that night and she takes off all her makeup, which takes fucking forever because it took her three hours to put it on, and she just she wipes off all that cake, all that cake off of her face, and then she looks at herself in the mirror and goes, I don't love myself. Why can't I accept myself? You don't see the suicidal thoughts of the people that live their lives through external validation. You don't see the lack of fulfillment. You don't hear about how people that appear to have all the followers and all the adulation and all the social approval that 
desperately cry out for the approval of themselves. For they had not given it to themselves, so they sought it outside. That's what I see within you, Mr. X. Which is that you think you're a failure because you can't get any girl. No, 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 no. 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 Getting the girl was never the idea. Getting yourself was always the idea. Reconnecting with yourself. Truly understanding what it means to be a man, a human being. Which is to know that your inherent source is eternal. Which is to know that you have a position in life right now available to you which is rarer beyond rare. It's something that no human being has really ever had access to before. You are living in the best time possible. You are literally living in the most prosperous time any human being has ever lived in the history of the entire universe. So you have that. But what you also have is this idea which that I can walk a path of my own destiny. I can design my own path which says that I'm going to increase the love, peace, and joy in people's lives. I'm going to help to reduce suffering in whatever way that manifests. It doesn't matter what vehicle I will drive in my life, but surely I will take tremendous incredible care to the driver himself realizing that the driver himself is eternal the driver being your eternal essence of who you are you are in this life right now for a brief moment in time somewhere between 75 to 85 years on average with it what you will do i cannot tell you but what i can say is that if you wish to end up looking back at your life thinking that that was good that i lived a good life it will not be measured in the people or the things or the events that you accumulated outside of yourself. All you have to do is look into the memoirs of people who are terminally ill, those who are on their deathbeds in their last dying days. You hear what they have to say. And none of them will say that, oh, I lived a good life because I drove awesome cars or because I had so many sexy women on my arm. Almost everyone will relate back to that. Maybe those will be the regrets. They'll tell you about the regrets. But what they'll relate back to you is that what mattered most was the time that I shared with other people in meaningful connection. You know, the effect that people had on me and the effect I had on them. You know, that last hug that I said, that last hug that I had with my mother, that last time I said I love you to my child. Those are the things that you remember before your life goes. And then you will surely transition on into the next vibration of energy in this world, whether you come back as a tree, whether you come back as a, a wave in the ocean, or maybe as a bird in the tree. Who knows if you'll ever be reborn into another human manifestation? Who knows if, there's a, if there is a heaven up there waiting for you, or a hell waiting there for you? I don't know. I don't know. It seems unlikely to me, but I don't know. I'm not going to rule it out. Who knows? Who knows? Well, that's the question, isn't it? Because nobody knows. And so if nobody knows, then you have a proposition before you. The proposition is that how will you live this life? What is the meaning of your life? Who are you? These big questions. These are big questions, but they don't have to be difficult. They don't have to be complex. They are large and they are big in the sense that they require your energy. They require your dedication. Your dedication to truth and your dedication to beauty. So you imbue these propositions, these proposing questions with truth and beauty, and then you answer them. So when you think about who am I, when you think about what will my life become, when you think about what does it mean for me to no longer be attached to the external and to ground myself deeply over the internal, always color everything with beautiful truth. What would be my beautiful truth if I was to no longer look at myself as a failure because I couldn't get a girl? What would be beautifully true about rectifying that? Well, what about my client? What about what he said? How about I reconnect back to myself? Because surely any woman worth her salt, any woman worth the ground with which she stands upon is one that would see beyond the facade, the mask of a successful man which has money, cars and houses and all the rest. Surely it would be a woman that would look into your internal spirit, that would look at the quality of your character, that would look at how you would be as a father, how you would be as her partner bonded, whether it be for life or in this moment in time. Someone that she could, in her quiet hours, her desperate, dark hours, in the pain and the trauma of her life, whether her mother passes away, whether her brother got into a car accident, maybe a murderer, a serial killer took away your child, that you'd be the quality of man that she could rest her heart upon, that she could softly, in a moment, relinquish all of her pain and come to know true harmony, eternally. 
Surely that is the woman that you desire. Surely amongst all other things of how that would manifest, and that is not to say it is mutually exclusive that you would not find a beautiful woman that could also maintain that character and spirit. Of course. I'm sure they're all out there. There are many out there. Can I find that in my current in my current partner? Haley? Not only is she physically externally beautiful, but her spirit is such such an alignment with that. But I love her heart first. I love her heart first. Despite her external physical beauty, I love her heart first. Because that's really what matters at the end of the day. Now, let's reverse engineer here. How on earth does one go about attracting this type of woman into your life that is not only beautiful on the outside, but beautiful on the inside? How would one go about that? Well, surely you would look at yourself as a project, as a journey, as a process that you would trust in the process and allow the process to take care of you. That the journey itself is one that is for life and that you will never complete, but the very pursuit of it is perfection. You will never be perfect, but the pursuit of perfection is in and of itself perfect because it is that indeterrable drive to not only develop the best of yourself, but why? Why do these things? Why do we do these things? We do these things so that we could give to someone else. All these things we do, not for ourselves, but for others. So, okay. Well, let's get a rubric. Let's get a framework for how we will navigate this then if we're really completely detached from the external now and we're really focused on the internal drive here. Seems like a really big pond. Seems like a really big forest to excavate here without any plan. Well, I've got the plan for you. I've got a plan for you if you'd like to indulge, which would be, how about we perceive ourselves as a temple and so that you'd walk out into this forest, you walk out into this giant jungle and that you clear, you clear a nice hundred by hundred square meter fertile land upon which you would lay foundations and you'd build a temple founded upon your purpose why you're here, why you wake up in the morning. That's always the first port of call. First port of call is to understand why it is that you wake up in the morning. What is your drive? And then from there, you develop your physical, right? your physical mechanic, the way that you engage this world. For If you do not have a functioning physical mechanic and if you treat it so poorly, if you don't give it the adequate sleep, if you force it to ingest ancestrally incongruent products, processed food, seed oils, refined carbohydrates, just bullshit, then surely your physical mechanic is not going to be in its prime condition. So you will not be able to do the best work that you can. All right, live as ancestrally aligned as you possibly can, as ancestrally appropriate. All right. That's all. I'm going to leave that right there and you can go ahead and research more into that. But to have a strong mechanic, to be able to serve your work throughout the rest of his life, making sure that you're doing the movements that would ensure strong joint health Right, strong spinal health, strong core. Right, that you don't just develop pillowy muscles without a strong frame underneath it. No, allow the allow the aesthetics of your physical development to be a byproduct of your utility. Allow the utility of you being able to pull heavy things, move heavy things, to be able to be liquid and mobile, to be able to unlock the energy centers within you, to be able to express yourself fully. So dance, so play, so move, so swim. Jump, roll, dive, make aggressive, aggressive, powerful love. Right, all these things. I, there was a gentleman in the gym the other day. German gym the other day who was being coached by another personal trainer. And he would have to be, I would say 55, maybe 60, but quite overweight. He would be on, he would be, he would just be teetering on obese, but very, quite overweight. And he could barely perform a bridge off the ground, a hip bridge. So I'm not talking about like a plank. I'm talking about lying flat on the ground. You lie flat on the ground. You bring your heels up towards your butt. So your knees are going to be able to bend. And all you have to do is just put your hands on the floor, push your hips to the sky. Right, a glute bridge, hip bridge. He could barely get his hips off the ground. Now, I'm not sure if any of you... <laughs> that's about to be a dick. <laughs> But actually, it's true. That's why it is a bit dickish. So I'll remove that there. I'll, I'll uh, temper my feistiness here. For those of you that are sexually well-practiced, you'd be aware of the fundamental movement performed in most of sex, which is hip thrusting from the male perspective. Whether you are in missionary, dog style, uh, 
even with a uh, cowgirl, right? You're still going to have some form of hip thrusting, particularly if you are in a cowgirl position where your woman is riding you, but you bring her forward so her head is up by your head and you are penetrating her from below. That is basically a repetition of hip hip bridging, glute bridging. So when I saw this, when I saw this gentleman, and by the way, this is not me, obviously I'm not going to use this, I don't even know his name, but this is not me trying to tear him down as a human being. This is me looking at the state, the poor state of his physicality in which that if I was his wife or if I was his woman, I would be very sexually dissatisfied by the fact of the, the nature, the true reality of which that he can't even perform a glute bridge, which means he can't even thrust upwards for he lacks not only the core stability and the core training within his hip flexes, within his the activation within his glutes, glute med, glute max, and just the, the overall core stability or the endurance. We haven't talked about the endurance. Like he can't even do one. Couldn't even do one. So he doesn't even have the range, the mobility to be able to get his hips up there. But what is said for the maintenance of that, the ability to pump vigorously, wildly, with great, great vigor and power, it's not there at all. It's, abs- it's obsolete. So when I saw that, I thought, I wish you the absolute best. And I really hope that as you're working with this personal trainer, shout out to her, I won't use her name. She's a great personal trainer and I hope that he stays dedicated. I hope that he gets his nutrition in order, that he removes the excessive body fat. Because what, by the way, why is it so difficult other than the fact that his uh, core facilities are completely undertrained? That's one reason why he can't perform the movement. But the other reason is because he's holding... I would say an excess of 25 to 30 kilos of non-functional weight of just visceral body fat, which is making it extraordinarily hard. And I imagine, imagine you trying to do that. For any one of you listening right now, try to perform a glute bridge with 50, 60 kilos more weight than you should. All right, just go put it, get, get, a dar- get a barbell, get a couple 20s on the side, right? And just perform a glute bridge. And you'll realize how fucking difficult it is to maintain for reps, do that for 20 reps, All right? If you're 60, 70 kilos listening to this, go get a 20 kilo Olympic barbell, put let's say 40 kilos other side. So that would be 20, 40, so what's that be? 100 kilos, All right? Get a 100 kilo barbell and just try and perform that for reps. That's probably what it would feel like if you were carrying 10 to 15, 20 kilos of excess body fat and then put another human being on top of you. See, when you're performing a glute bridge with a girl on top of you, you're carrying her weight. Unless she is in a position where that she's just kind of floating in midair and she's up on all fours and you're underneath her, that's a different thing. But, you know, you want to get your hips involved. You want to get her hips riding yours. So what I'm pointing towards here when we're going onto this development thing, like I said, we've got quite granular with this. I'm just going to get some water. Give me a sec. So where we're going with all this is the fact that if you don't have the correct physical development, even in a very, what seems like a very small part of life, it's no small part of life. If you don't have the physicality to be able to please your woman, to be able to satisfy for hours upon hours when the requirement is there, not to say that all sex sessions, well, I really should say making love sessions, great love makes great sex, but not all of your sexual penetration sessions need to last hours and hours and hours, but you should have the maintenance, the stamina, the ability to be able to do so. Not only cardiovascularly, like core-wise, strength-wise, power-wise. Physicality needs to be there. And this is not also, this is, by the way, this is, I'm talking about it from a male perspective here, very masculine energy-based, but it applies to women as well. If you're a woman listening to this, I don't know if you are, that you need to be in top tip shop as well. You need to be tip top shape as well. You'd be in fit, mint condition as well. Not just be able to sexually, be able to go with your partner for that amount of time and for that amount of vigorous nature. So you're not always having to stop because you're absolutely out of breath. But also when it comes to other areas of life now, this is how important your physical mechanic is to be able to, if you one day plan to have children, to be able to run around with them. When I was a personal trainer, my first couple of years coming out of high school, my first business, that was one of the most common things that people north of 35 would come to me for. The clients that I worked or worked with north of 35 were ones that have children and their children are roughly five, you know, three to eight years old, somewhere between there. And so they had them in their mid to late 20s and now they're kind of in their early mid 30s and they realize that they just can't go with them. They can't go snowboarding with their kids because they're too damn fat. They're so overweight. Their hearts are collapsing under the weight. 
and I, I don't mince words here. I don't mince words here because people that have allowed themselves to get that weight, get to that weight, they know. They know. I know that you're not happy with yourself. And I'm here to tell you that no snowflake conversation is going to fix that. No me saying to you that, no, you're healthy at any weight. You're healthy. It's just fundamentally incorrect. It is fundamentally incorrect that you're healthy at any weight. We know that an excess amount of body fat and non-functional weight leads to negative health outcomes. We know that by you having excess body fat places excessive tension on your heart, which is going to lead to a failure at some point. Heart failure is going to kill the majority of people in this life. Right? One of the most leading causes of death, at least in Australia, is heart failure, heart disease. Right? Whether it's because of the blocking of the arteries or the fact that the heart just gives out itself because it's not designed to live with that much weight on it. Anyways, you, you hear my point here. You hear my point in which that you want longevity, you want to be able to be there for a long life for people, then you better do some resistance training. You better get your nutrition order. You better not be eating processed rubbish all day long. You better understand that for the most of our evolutionary biological development, human beings, we're in a starvation period. We are designed to be lean. We are designed to be lean because we had to adapt to the situation in which that we didn't have excessive calories. We didn't have supermarkets. You didn't have refrigerators. You had to literally hunt what you needed to eat. And fuck, that's hard. Fuck, that is hard. I dare one of you. I dare, I've st- I'm not even dare. I encourage the majority of you who have the capability to go down to an archery range. Go spend an afternoon this weekend. Go book it in. Go book a private lesson if you need to. Because if you've never done it before, definitely get the right instruction. But go down to an archery range and just spend the day trying to hit the target. Try to hit the bullseye. Try to put five arrows. Try to put precisely five arrows in the bullseye. Which means that five out of five times, you would have ended that animal's life. Try to do that. Try to do that from anywhere between 10 to 20 feet. 10 to 20 feet trying to put five arrows in the middle of the bullseye is very difficult. And then try to do that from... Now, 10 to 20 feet means you got fucking close to that animal, by the way. Like that animal, either you had a massive wind advantage there and they just couldn't smell you. Or they were just idiots. They were just stupid. They were just stupid animals that day. I don't know. Love drunk. But... Generally speaking, you're probably going to need some have an effective range, an effective shooting range between zero to fifty feet. Fifty being the absolute maximum. But you would think somewhere between twenty five to thirty five feet is a reasonable range to get within to be able to shoot an animal down with an arrow reliably to be able to put it on a vital zone. Try and do that. It's pretty difficult. I haven't been hunting myself with a bow and arrow. I've just been training with my compound bow, my hunting bow. And it's really difficult. I went up to Mike's farm the other day and we'll sh- uh, this was actually a couple months ago, but I was at his place the other day, but I was at his farm uh, uh, a couple months ago and we were shooting arrows and I was going from 20 feet and it's really hard to put arrows reliably on the bullseye from 20 feet. I'm not that good. I'm not that good yet. Requires a lot of practice and I don't practice every day. What I'm trying to point out for you right now is that in order to be so effective, in order to make your living, to survive as a human being by hunting animals, you're going to have lean times. You're going to have lean times because animals are just as well adapted to evade us, their predators. Our prey are very good at being prey. Right? If they were not good at being prey, we would have no prey to hunt. The reason why I brought this up is because it was very unlikely that you would find any human being throughout most of our evolutionary development that would have an excessive amount of non-functional weight every ounce of weight you had on your body had to be functional in order to just simply survive so we are designed to be fit we are designed to be healthy to be strong to be mobile and so it applies to the rest of our lives you want to live a long good life well, you better take care of your take care of your mechanic you better take care of that body you want to have powerful rich fulfilling love making sessions in which that you are able to release your consciousness in which that your woman is left there shaking. She is shaking in the bed for minutes after you are done because you had provided a rolling orgasm in which that it was not just one orgasm. Most girls, most girls, I'm not going to put anyone on flame here, but I've had many conversations with many of my girlfriends, be it actual girlfriends, like actual sexual partners, or just my girl. Hey guys, it's Adam here. I apologize for the intrusion. However, something catastrophic happened in the middle of recording in which that the batteries on my H6 recorder died 
half an hour before I even realized because I was so deep in the presence and just dropping fire in this session that I just went on for about half an hour and didn't even realize. So I was left here with a creative decision as to whether to just go with that audio, which would be recorded from my camera here, 10 meters back, it's super echoey, or to re-record and with the appropriate audio equipment. However, in editing, what I realized is that I'm never gonna be able to recreate the magic that happened in the moment. And I think that's actually gonna give you more benefit than the re-recorded version, which is what I, I did. I actually went back and tried to recap the 30, 40 minutes that I had uh, missed that was lost. However, it's just not the same. So for the next half an hour or so, you're gonna hear a hit on the audio. It's not gonna be as good, but it is audible and I have done my best with all the levels and everything to make it as less echoey as possible. But I really think you'll get more benefit from that than hearing the re-recorded version. So in about half an hour's time, you'll hear it switch over and it'll go back to the awesome podcast mic quality. And that's when I picked up once I finally realized that the audio recording had actually stopped. So my apologies, it's totally my fault, full responsibility. I just didn't realize the batteries had gone out. So please enjoy the next half an hour and I'm sure you'll get a lot from it. And it'll just take you a two, maybe three or four seconds to adjust the audio change. So enjoy. <laughs> She is shaking in the bed for minutes after you are done because you have provided a rolling orgasm in which that, it was not just one orgasm. Most girls, most girls, I'm not gonna put anyone on flame here, but I've had many conversations with many of my girlfriends, be it actual girlfriends, like actual sexual partners, or just my girl slash friends, girls that I'm just platonically friends with, that will relay to me the fact that they rarely have orgasms, rarely. Even girls that have long-time partners who you would think would be the most comfortable with, that would be having the most orgasms with because they're so intimately intertwined that they just get each other, they know which buttons to push, when to push them. It's actually those that have been in those normal relationships that likely report, and that I've just seen in my own anecdotal life, that report that they have the least amount of orgasms. Because as partners, right, they relegated their sexual practice down to something that is nothing but a physical stimulation. Now for those that are very new to the world of sexual practice, you need to understand that in order to bring about a true full body orgasm in which that not only do you release the body, but you release the mind, the spirit, you can help someone elevate into this dissolution of time and self to which they can just experience really true ecstasy, really a true embodiment of what it means to be one. You must transcend the physical and the mind, and step into that spiritual essence, that spiritual arena. No world, no mind, no time. You're not going to get there through even just one orgasm, physically. In order for a woman to have that full, as well, my girlfriend often reports back to me as tingles in the face, in which that there's meaningful periods of time in which they don't even know who they are. They don't know who they are anymore. That their bodies shake. This morning, I had very powerful sex, very powerful love with my girlfriend, and she was left there shaking on the bed for several minutes. <laughs> there's nothing, there's nothing that will make a man smile more than seeing that and just breathing deeply. Um, I'm not sure how much she wants me to share on this podcast. I'm sure she gets, I think she gets a turn off from it actually. She's reported back to me saying that she gets turned on when I talk about our sex in our podcast. But let me just say this, because I don't want to get too, too, uh, too animalistic with it. But as you are, we were in the position of where that she's lying down flat on her belly, with her hips slightly poked up in the air, and I was on top of her. So it's really like a flat down doggy style position, but she's flat down on the bed. And yeah, and in rolling orgasms as well as going with in which that, you know, once you bring it to orgasm once, you don't let up. You don't give her time to recover. Keep penetrating harder and harder and harder. And then she'll get this again. And then again, don't let her let up, keep going, keep going. And there's this sense of just surrender, this yielding that the woman goes through, in which she has to yield her internal tension to realize that I'm going for a ride here and I have no control over this. I've given my full trust to this man and I trust him to take care of me and he's going to send me into oblivion, sexual oblivion, which so there's a complete removal of my sense of self. You know, that is absolute, it's a symphony of ecstasy. And you reach this point in which that maybe six or seven orgasms go by, six, seven orgasms go by to the point in which that 
they are just screaming into the pillow. So it's not to wake from the housemate, screaming into the pillow. And then when it's all said and done, they're left shaking. Not only their bodies shaking, but their spirits. But you do need to have an extreme physical command in order to be able to do that, to be able to penetrate long and hard, long and deep, for long periods of time, to the point where you have sweat, and beads of sweat dripping down your chest, and that turns around even more. Where we are in this podcast right now is me actually just describing the temple to you, what it means to develop supreme excellence. So we went through purpose. Let's get a recap here so we reset ourselves in the podcast. Had that purpose. Why you wake up in the morning? What the hell are you here to do in this life? Purpose, to make it really simple for you here, as we just recap here, is that we break it down between vehicles and drivers. If you'd like to know more about this, I did a podcast called When You've Lost Meaning in Life. It's probably the most popular, one of the most popular episodes of this podcast ever done. It's maybe 20 episodes below. It's when you've lost meaning in life. And I describe this in much greater detail. But you have infinite vehicles available to you in this life, whether you want to be a plasterer, a butcher, a financial trader, right? whether you want to be working with children, you want to be a teacher, a doctor, a fireman. Those are all vehicles that your eternal driver, who you are, will utilize to serve their meaningful work in this life. That is how we summarize, how I like to summarize purpose. And so it does not matter how grand, how amazing, whether you are running crypto exchanges, whether you are just chopping up meat at the local butcher, it does not matter. The flipping patties does not matter. What matters is the vibration with which you engage in such activities, the intent behind it, because if you are not there to help other people, then why are you there? If you are not there to improve the experience of another human being, then why are you there? This comes back to this whole success and failure thing about whether you get a girl or not. It's just such a ridiculous question. It's such a ridiculous statement to even consider in which that it's not about whether you get a girl or not, right? Because whether you get a girl or not is irrelevant. If you don't get yourself to the point in which that you can walk this life through, which that you would deliver the best of your gifts, the best of your values, it would have been a waste. It would have been a waste. Nor would a beautiful woman want to engage a man who is not focused on that. So that would never even come about. But any beautiful woman that did walk into your life as a fact of you just presenting her with financial gains, with gifts, with some form of validation or self likely that she's seeking, that that would not be the woman that you want to spend your life with anyway. That would not be the woman that you want to create children with anyway. So the woman that you drew the true desire, the woman that actually sees you for who you are, the woman that would be there for you when your mother passes away, when you're in the deep of your trauma, the deep of your pain, the woman that you actually want to be your raw, true, vulnerable self with, the woman that you would allow yourself to fully love, not only that would love you, but you would allow yourself to love her. That woman would want to see within you a deep burning purpose a deep driving purpose that detaches from the external manifestation and grounds deeply into the internal generation. That one in there, you, you beat that heart, you bang the drum with your heart, that's all matters. So you settle up that purpose and I like that we've got a lecture of fire in there. And then you move into this physical, okay, well if, I need, if I'm going to be here for a bit of time, we're going to be here for a bit of time, in the longness of life, it is very short. Life is long, but it is very short in its longness. And what that means to say is that you need to hold a gravity for the fact that you're gonna be here for a little bit of time, but you're not gonna be here forever. So I need to move. And if I'm gonna move, I'm gonna move in the best way that I possibly can, but I can't do it in a way in which that I'm, I'm sprinting. I can't just stay up all night, every single night. I can't just eat shit food. I can't just allow my body to waste away because I need this thing to work. I need this thing to work for a while which means that I'm going to do the prehab. The prehab, not the rehab, but the prehab. I'm going to do the joint and core stabilizing movements. I'm going to make sure that my body is strong and functional. I'm going to make sure that I have the cardiovascular capacity to be able to run around with my children, to be able to take my, my daughter on hiking trips up in the forest. I'm going to make sure that I can pleasure and satisfy my woman sexually to the point of rolling orgasms to the point in which that she squirts all over the bed and she's left shaking at the end and that her entire consciousness, her entire spirit has left this ether and that now actually somehow yours has joined her in that and that you're both floating in a dance, floating in the dance of the sky above you and beneath you. And now it is just all one. That is the sexual experience that you have. But it's got nothing to do with whether she gets off or you get off. No, that you two come together. You come together in both and every sense of that meaning, of that word. Fantastic, you get physical mechanic there. 
right? And that, all that aesthetic is all a byproduct of the utility. Then we move into the next part of the temple, mental development, your framework for perceiving the world. How do you perceive this life? That is your mental development. And that would be informed by listening to, you know, venerable elders, by listening to those that have passed down wisdom. That, and what is wisdom, by the way? Wisdom is internalized and practiced knowledge. Right? You, you're getting knowledge from someone else. Right now, you're getting knowledge from me because I know this. But you don't know this. Knowing this yourself is wisdom. When you come, as I started this podcast with, to go out and to face off with your self-inadequacies, with that which plagues you about your limiting beliefs, negative self-perceptions, and egoic attachments to the things in this world in which that you believe you are not destined worthy of, that which you have not accepted about yourself, and you go out to another human being and say, I'll put that to the side. Well, put all that to the side. And I'm going to go ahead and give them love, peace, and joy. I'm going to just give them love. No, excuse me, man. I know this is fucking random, but I was just walking by today. I just want to say that you look like a really good dude. You look like a good guy. I just want to say that thank you for being you. My name's Adam. If you could put aside all of the shit that exists within you that is covering your spiritual diamond, as I always talk about, that light that can never be broken within you, that spiritual diamond shining within you, but it is so laden with the shit, with the trauma, the unresolved pain of your life, for you, Mr. Curious Boy, in this podcast, that's the this podcast, whatever unresolved trauma that exists within you in which that you believe that you need to go and make you successful, right? whatever that is, put all that aside and just get, get yourself... Get yourself a shovel and you just dig in one centimeter. And by one centimeter, you reveal a little light that would allow you to go to another human being and realize that I want to make this person's day slightly better. Even if only by 1%, by me, by me giving them a well wish, a compliment, a direct compliment, or a direct seek to connect, I improve that person's life. And by improving that person's life, you will reciprocally feel better. Reciprocal altruism. I do good, I feel good. Human beings are mirrors. Human beings, we are mirrors. It's very hard to give love to someone and to not feel it back. Even if they are so stuck within their own darkness that they don't appear to be shining your light back, you know that at some point in their day they'll reflect on that and they'll think, that girl's pretty nice. Even if they couldn't bring it within themselves to say it to you then and there. Even if they didn't get it. But maybe five days later, ten days later, they're having a rough time and they realize life's pretty shit. But there was that one dude, there was that one guy who came up to me and gave me pure love. Maybe I won't in my life today because someone did that for me. Maybe I can do that for someone else. And now you see a pay it forward. Now you see an interconnectivity between the souls of this world. And on that interconnectivity is where you'll find such beauty and such truth. And so your mental framework is what I'm talking about here. Mental framework, the way that you perceive world, the world. Where do you enter a nihilistic perspective in which that you think that life is meaningless? That, you know, if we're all gonna die, what's the meaning in it? Yeah, that's, that's a reasonable argument. And two, you have to consider the fact that you are living. It's reasonable to get down on life and to think life is meaningless and that there's no point in doing anything. I may as well just be this fat, overweight, obese, just, just sorry excuse for a human being that just takes from everyone else, that is just going to allow himself this rare, beautiful thing to fall to the wasteland. Right, that's fine until you have to consider that you are actually living and that we have robust, objective measures for joy for meaning and for truth and for fulfillment as a human being. And it surely is not in becoming a wasteful piece of shit that just takes from everyone else and tries to burn other people down. We know that we feel better when we help other people. We know that human beings are wired to be this way. We know that we are wired to feel good and we receive dopamine pumps in our mind when we exercise, move, because that would have been a proxy to being successful as a hunter, as a forager as sustaining ourselves in order to get our genes into the next generation. There's a reason why physical exertion makes you feel good afterwards. Because it was, would have been indicative and the only time you would have expended that level of calorie was because you had to get after something to give you more calories. So that you could generate another beautiful being in this world. 
There's a reason why physical movement makes you feel better. There's a reason why interconnected love making makes you feel better. There's a way, there's a reason why caring for another human being makes you feel better. There's a re- anytime something inherently makes you feel good that is detached from a financial gain, from a marketable gain in which that our capitalistic world, which I'm not inherently shitting upon because it's definitely better than anything else human beings have tried. Capitalism in itself is not perfect, but it's certainly better than communism. It's certainly better than socialism. It's certainly better than totalitarian authoritarianism. If we're going to live in this capitalistic world, yeah, you're going to be hijacked, there's going to be charlatans, there's going to be set snake oil salesmen. It's certainly not me though, because what? Because I'm telling you the hard shit. I'm telling you that actually, you're going to have to, you have to generate a purpose for yourself. You can't, you can't just rely on other people to give that to you. You can't just rely on that when they tell you, yeah. yeah. So I'm sharing that side. Getting back to it. You can't just rely on other people that are just going to tell you that, yeah, eat shit food. And they tell you that it's good for you. They tell you eat this vegan burger. Yeah, no, that's not going to make you happy. So we're getting back to the mental development here. So I go, I'm not even sorry. We get off on these tangents. But this mental development, coming right back to it. How do you perceive this world? Why do you have a well-balanced mind that can acknowledge the fact that I made a mistake. Probably the most important thing when it comes to mental framework is realizing that you are fallible. You are not infallible, but you are fallible. You will fall. You have to have humility to realize that you don't know everything. Reach out when things are tough, when the shield gets too heavy. It's okay to take a knee and ask someone else for help. And hopefully along your path, you generate more wisdom as the day goes by. More wisdom as the days go by. I see the world as a team. Don't get nihilistic. Don't think that it's all worth nothing. Maybe the grand scale of the entire universe, but that scale is ridiculous. Because you're not going to be around to see that. You know what you are around for? Now. You're around for now. You're around for this moment. And it's in this moment that things matter. The love, peace, and joy you can give to someone else matters now. The fulfillment that you feel now, the success that you feel now within yourself. You know, that acceptance you feel now, that worth, that success. Realizing that I came to grips with my own trauma, my unresolved pain in the past, the sexual abuse, psychological abuse, the physiological abuse, the demeaning abuse that I suffered in my life, the abandonment that I experienced in my life. Coming to grips with that now, that's what matters now. Because that allows you to give the best of yourself to another person now. It's all here for you now. So don't get, don't get down on whether things mean something to this world in 100 years, 50 years, 5,000 years, 50,000 years from now. It doesn't matter. What matters is now. Mental framework, that's what we're talking about right there. And then finally, if we've gone through purpose, physical, mental, whoa, social, social development. Social development, starting off very Tactically, we're talking about your romantic relationships, we're talking about your friendships, we're talking about your family relationships, we're talking about the way you engage with human beings in general. Social development. We're talking about the way that you execute social cues, social cues, I should say, the way that you execute social cues, the way that you perceive and receive social cues. We're talking about the way that other people feel when you engage with them. We're talking about the way that you can execute principles such as being direct, congruent, authentic, and with empathy. Let's break that down. What does it mean to be direct? It means to be direct with your intent. It means to be upfront and honest. No matter what, no, that you don't, you know, you don't misalign your intent based on the outcome. You don't change your intent because you want a different outcome. No, the intent comes first and whatever happens, happens. The leaves will fall as they may as a result of me being direct, upfront and honest. If they don't like it, if a girl doesn't like to hear the fact that actually I'm in a stage of my life right now where I just need to be open and free and I'm going through these open relationships where I'm trying to understand myself. I actually came from a pretty, got pretty burnt in the last monogamous relationship and I'm a little bit traumatized by it and I just don't want to be in a monogamous relationship. I just want to take things very slow and very easy, very open. But it's not going to be casual. It's not going to be transactional. When you're with me, you get all of me. I'll care for you. I'll care for you in this moment. I don't need to connect our friendships, our friend and our family, and we don't need to go into each other's birthdays, events, etc. like an exclusive and honest relationship. But when we do see each other, we get all of each other, and you'll feel that love, and I'll be there to listen to you, and to see you for who you are, to have 
open, caring sex, an open, caring relationship, done with true care, that can be done. That's what I encourage to everyone that listens to me. If you're going to go down that path, that's the path I've lived prior to the last few months, for the last six years. I've done monogamy from zero to zero to 19, then open from 19 to 21, then from 21 to, no, that's not right. From from a few months at 19, then monogamy again from 19 to 22, then from 22 to 28, open, and then now back into monogamy. Right? These lessons, these lessons that you learn. What's the best mating style? The style that allows you to learn what you need to learn right now. Be flexible, be fluid. Don't listen to anyone that says that they know what's best for you. No. No. For sure, life is far too complex for any one academic, for any one author, for any one podcaster to tell you this is how you should live your life. You know, when I'm going through these principles, I'm going through a framework because I don't know you. I don't know your life. But I'm going through the frameworks that I think would truly benefit. So you're looking at these relationships, we're going to sort of romantic there, but we can look at the monogamous, we can look at the exclusive, you can look at what it is you think is best to get and bring another human being to life. But surely those principles would have to be there. That's where we're going on, direct. That's where actually the goals of that whole discussion from, which is that being direct. Like even if you think that someone is leaning towards monogamy exclusive, and you think that they're misaligned with you, you don't change your intent to suit them because you want them to come into your life. If this girl says, actually, I'm just hoping to be exclusive, I want to really kind of develop something, create something more meaningful one person, you know, over an extended period of time, she says that to you, you don't then flip on your intent and say, oh, well, that's fine, well, then anyways, well, forget about that whole open thing I was talking about, okay, I'll do that. No, that would be breaking your direct principle, that would be breaking all your principles, actually, but particularly the direct one. Or if you just all of a sudden said indirectly, so I'm being indirect about your intent. I say this with guys all the time, Guys that just waste away their lives being best friends with a girl, not ever showing their intent. And then eventually she finds someone else, then you get heartbroken because you've never been upfront about your intent. Now, just because you've got to be upfront about your intent doesn't mean someone else is going to uh, mirror that, reflect that back, and have a similar alignment. But at least gives them the opportunity. How many of you are wasting away your lives hiding your intent? If you're not going to be direct, no one will trust you because they never know what you want. Indirect people are untrustworthy by nature. I never know what you're thinking. I never know how you feel. I never know where I stand in relation to that. Moving on to the next principle, direct congruent. Congruency, what does that mean? External congruency. When I'm using the word congruence, I'm talking about that I say what I'll do and I'll do what I say that my external actions are congruent. That if I have said to a woman that I'll always tell you how I feel, that if something that I'm working through and there is something that I'm working through, I'll let you know about that. And if there's any kind of emotional flux within me, I'll let you know about that and I'll let you know the process that I go through. And then all of a sudden, something happens in your life in which I don't know maybe your father passes away. Maybe a family member gets into a car crash and you shut down or you get the seeds of shutting down and you want to crawl up into a ball and isolate yourself. Would that be congruent to the girl that you're with? A romantic partner? Even though you said that you would always let her know, you would always let her in. You would always be that open ball of complete congruence that you two were a team, a co-creation. Is that congruent for you to then shut down in your time of most need? No, it's not. That's incongruent. Is it congruent to be a direct leading man on your first day with a woman? You know, to be making moves, making plays, saying we're going here, we're going there, let's do this. No, it's not unempathetic, of course, we've got all principles here. Empathy is that you, of course, want her instruction. How do you feel about this? You know? How do you feel this adventure? Hey, I'm taking this adventure. She goes, yeah, oh yeah, okay, let's go. So you're weaving through that. And then when you take her hand, you look at the eyes and kiss her for the first time. You weren't waiting for her to tell you, hey, um, it's okay for you to kiss her. It's okay for you to hold her hand. No, no, 
no, don't fall into the wokeism, don't fall into the left progressive of you have to get a written permission slip for every little physical act of human connection, that's ridiculous. Don't allow them to infiltrate your mind. Don't allow these politicians to say that you, know, you can't have sex until you get an affirmative yes, it's okay that we have sex. I tell you right now, no girl that I've ever been involved with has ever asked me for that, and no girl I've ever been involved with sexually has ever been upset that I didn't ask her for that. It's a, it's a trick. It's a mean, mean trick that the progressive woke lefts are trying to get this ridiculous... Now, by the way, I'm also not for this derogative, misogynistic, just pirate-like behavior of a man in which uh, you just completely ignore all the women's signals and you just get yours. Of course not. Neither. I don't want you guys to be these chauvinistic misogynists that don't care for women. I also don't want you to be these absolute snowflakes that have absolutely no spinal fluid, no backbone whatsoever. No, how about the good guy in the middle? There's direct, congruent, authentic good empathy. Who's going to lead? Why he's going to be congruent in his lead. That if he was willing to take her hand, if he was willing to kiss her, that when he comes back into the bedroom, that it doesn't turn into a puddle of self inadequacy. Or, and that by the way doesn't just manifest as the inability to lead sexually, but it can also manifest as the excessive, excessive push in which that you're doing too much too fast when you're not attuned to her social cues and you're making her uncomfortable as a result of that. That is also someone who I would say is being very incongruent. So incongruency, just someone to back up here. If we've set the path through being direct, we set the path through being congruent, it means that you always get a feathers of the same bird, right? You get patterns in the sand, you get waves of the same ocean with me. What I say is what I do. And you always get the same from me. In the sense that you never have to guess. Never have to guess what comes up from me. You know that this guy's integral because he's congruent. You know he'll be there, you know he'll show up because he's congruent. His external manifestations, his external behaviors. Fantastic. Then you look into the third principle there authenticity. So we're direct congruent, authentic. Authentic, what does that mean? Internal, man. internal measure. That compass within you of what's right and what's wrong. Optimizing for the best of both people. What's best here? What's the best outcome here for both of us? Not what's the, what's the best outcome for just me, or what's just the best outcome for them. So what's the best outcome for both of us here? Is it authentic? Is it authentic to lie to people? You know, this, this, this is really the core of it here. We need to one of those fundamental principles of morality is lying. You know, there's white lies and there's, and there's black lies, if you will. Dark lies. Don't get caught in the racial connotation. But what's about there is light and darkness. Yeah, okay. Maybe a little white lie in which that I the girl says to you, what did you get me for Christmas? And you're like, I don't know much. But really, you got something really special. That's a white lie. I think we can get away with that. I think that's okay. It's for a great good, yeah? But a dark lie, a lie in which that you purport to be more attracted to a woman than you are. You lead her on, you use her, treat her like trash in that sense. It's inauthentic. If you're not attracted to a woman, don't keep inviting her out to dance. If you're not, if your heart isn't set on fire with this woman, then don't lead her to believe so. Inauthentic. If you don't like these people, if you don't just get these people, if you don't vibe with these people, why keep hanging out with them? If these people go out to the bar every single night, or at least Friday, Saturday night, and they, they dress up fancy, dress up in suits, but that's just not you. I don't want to dress up in a suit on Friday night. I want to be out on the beach, I want to be in a drum circle, I want to be dancing around the fire. I want to be breathing, doing Tai Chi, I want to be ecstatic dancing, getting wild in trouble with it. That's me. Then is it authentic for you to, because you want the approval of these other people who are gonna be out on the city strip, you know, drinking their margaritas, you know, snorting their coke and doing suits, suits, ties and coke. Is that you? Is that authentic to you? Maybe it is, maybe it's not though. And if it's not, why are you doing it? You don't, go to, you don't like all the nightclubs, like just for the fun of it, I'm not talking about social traffic. 
But I'm talking about would you go to a nightclub just for the fun of it? I just, I'm not, I don't, it's not me. I'll go to a nightclub if a friend's having a birthday. I'll go to a nightclub if I'm training a client. I'll go to a nightclub if I just want to test my own social skills, skills, social skills, social skills, and get that out right. I, you know, I'll use nightclub for various reasons, but I'm surely not going to a nightclub for the fun of it, like because I think it's fun. Because I'm not on that stage of life anymore. Rewind back to 18 to 22. Yeah, nightclubs were fun just for the sake of it. When I got over my own social anxiety around me, that's not me anymore. So that would be quite inauthentic if I just said to my girlfriend this weekend, hey, you know what? Go to the club for fun. <laughs> She'd be like, are you sure, Adam? <laughs> that doesn't sound very authentic. Like, yeah, you got me. Of course, that would never come out of my mouth. But if I said I'm going to a nightclub because I'm working with a client, or because I want to test uh, some social principles I've been working on, she would be like, okay, cool. Like, that would make sense. Not that I'm looking for approval, but her realizing that that was a aligned thing would make me realize that I'm not stepping out of my authenticity here. Is it authentic to keep having sexual interactions with a woman, even if you're just in your open style, but you just really don't get a thrill of life from this? There's no spice of life here. There's no beauty happening between you two. Is that authentic? Like, it's morality. It's when you're lying to yourself, you're lying to the people outside yourself. You need to check in with this authentic principle at all times, always. And then finally, we cover up with empathy. Our certain principles, our sound principles right here, direct and real authentic with empathy. That empathy should be applied in everything that I say here. When you look at direct, that you don't just be brutal and open and harsh with people to the point in which that you allow them to feel like pieces of shit. That you treat them with such bluntness that you don't even see the humanity in them. You don't see that the fact that they have their own emotional skill set, they have their own emotional predisposition, and you have to attend to that. When you are being faced with situations in which that it's likely that you're going to have to give a harsh truth, you shouldn't be harsh endemically, eternally, in which that you cut them and you don't allow them a bandage back. That's what it means to apply empathy, in which that we cut clean, but we heal strong. Cut clean, which means you make hard decisions, you let people know exactly where you're at, you maintain your congruency, your authenticity, but you make sure that if there was a wound or an open gash caused as a result of that, that you heal. You let them know that I still see you as a human being. I still want the best for you in life. I still want to give you that love, peace, and joy. Even if we can't be together now, for whatever reason, X, Y, Z, even if I can tell you this about yourself because I don't like the way that you're showing up in this relationship, okay, but just so you know, I still see you. I still love you. And I give you some time to work through it. And if we can't, if we can't work through this, then we'll separate. We'll separate knowing that it's because I want the best of both of us. It's because I want you to know that I see you. That's everything. Empathy is having a care and a concern for how the other person receives you. Empathy is realizing that you are not one of one. You are not a solo being in this universe. Well, there is really only one of us here, but one of us is all of us. So we need to take care of all of us in all of our ones. There's your empathy. You should apply to everything and anything that you do. Always consider how the other person feels before you act, as you act. Compare how you're concerned yourself with how the other person feels. Doesn't need to change what you're doing in its fundamental nature. You can be direct, still gonna be congruent, still gonna be authentic, but you can do so in a way that makes sure that when a cut is made, you offer them a bandage. The bandages in love, the bandages in seeing who they are, who they are. Yes, sir. As I was saying earlier in this podcast, some way through, in which that if you don't have that ability to just be able to give for the sake of giving, to be able to go up to five random people and just give them love, how socially underdeveloped. That shows to me you don't have a level of acceptance, a level of acceptance and a level of care within yourself to be able to give it to others. Now, I'm not saying you have to do that all day, every day, but surely test yourself. Surely go out there and see if you can do that. And surely see if you can detach from the external outcome. One of the key components of a social dynamics journey, to be so detached from the outcome in which that, as long as you did you, and you did the best that you could do, then you sleep well at night. Action for the sake of action. Love for the sake of love there. You know, the way that you engage others is surely reflective of the way that you engage yourself. If you hold limiting beliefs, negative self-perceptions, and egoic attachments, 
It manifests everywhere. You know, if you're poor in sexual relationships, you are poor in all of your other relationships, no doubt. You might think you're a good son. You might think you're a good brother. But if you are not good within your sexual dynamics, you are likely not good within yourself, which means you cannot be as good to other others in your life. It's pretty simple math. You have to look at why, though. If you're looking at fires or burning bridges or underdevelopment within any one aspect of the temple, we always ask why. Why is it that my social dynamics are so lacking? Why is it that I lack the relationships, the sexual relationships, the fulfilling relationships with myself? Is it because I've not given myself the same love that I wish to see from outside? You know, even wishing to see love from outside indicatively reflects that you have not received the love from yourself. For surely someone that loves themselves would not seek it from another. If you can't get that woman out of your mind, if you can't get women off of your mind, if you can't get sexual validation off of your mind, that speaks to a chasm, an internal void within you. Yeah. Yeah. What trauma has left unresolved within you, likely from your formative years that you have yet to reckon with, that you have yet to illuminate in part one and part two, alchemize into light, to dive deep into the darkness, to get a shovel, as I maybe have said earlier in this podcast, to get a shovel and to crack through the dirt covering your spiritual diamond to realize that there was always light within me. The light within me would never be broken. It had only been covered by the darkness of my life, the unresolved pain, the trauma of my life. The trauma that resulted in pain has not been resolved. So I'll do my best. I'll do my work to not run away from myself to not allow a perpetual disconnection from myself, but to truly connect with who I am, to truly understand who I am. Not just for the sake of me, but for the sake of all others. You know, these things we do, not just for ourselves, but for others. If that doesn't make you smile, I don't know what will. If I was to just reframe that phrase into these things we do, not for others, but for ourselves. See how my vocal tonality went downwards then? Because it felt bad. It felt bad to say these things we do, not for others, but for ourselves. It's like, well, that doesn't even make sense. It's like, what kind of life is that where you're just taking from people? And this is where we are in the social development of things. It's like, if you're going to be a social being that just looks to transact, you're going to take from people. If not, take their time, take their energy, but to take their approval. They're just as bad as each other. You know, for those of you that think that I don't think of myself as a very taking person, like, you know, I'm always trying to give my time to people. I'm always trying to, you know, surround myself with people. But why are you doing that? Because you're trying to take their approval. Yeah, you might give your energy and time to people, but if it's coming from the intent point of that, I'm trying to take their validation, aka get their validation. That's just as bad. It's just as dark. It's just as unresolved in the pain and the trauma of your life. It's not okay to pursue, it's, listen, default, it's not okay to pursue external validation. It will only lead to pain. It only leads to pain. But it's not okay to to pursue external validation from a point in which that you think that this is what will make you and this is what will define you as a good human being. And I know that sounds, I mean, that seems implicitly rhetorical, but there's something within that in which that people seem to think that as I get more and as I become more, then more people will love me. As I, as I prove myself more, then that would correct something within me. And that's what I was really trying to say before. That's the point I was trying to get at. My apologies if that didn't come out very clear, but now it has in which that yeah, you, your internal trauma will not be resolved by seeking more outside of yourself. If you don't love you now, it doesn't matter how much unconditional love is placed upon you. It'll never be yours. The only love that will be yours is the one that you generate. The one that you connect to internally. Knowing that it is always there for you. So the word generate was not the right word then. But return. The love that you return to. The worth that you return to. The harmony that you return to. And if you can apply this in all of your social engagements. right? That's what this world is. The interaction between different human beings. Social. The dynamic. The two of us which really there only is one of us here, one being. But we're fragmented. We're fragmented in an illusion of ego, which that I exist as Adam, you exist as you, listen to this. But just know that we're all one. 
Yeah. We need to transcend. We can transcend. Maybe we hold it off on that for now. I don't want to lose you in too deep in the spiritual weeds. But if we're going to accept that there are egos here, let's do our best. Let's do our best to take each other home. Let's do each other. Let's do our best to take each other home. You do that. That's a good life. That's a very good life. You know, it was a great depiction one, uh, one from an artist I saw one time of that we're all just walking each other home. Depiction of several religious slash spiritual figures. I mean, Buddha, Jesus Christ, uh, Muhammad might have been there, and or maybe it was Allah. And you know, you just got these 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 idols walking each other home, all from different points of belief and spiritual understanding, but all just walking each other home. It's like, isn't that isn't that social dynamics? <laughs> Isn't that what it means to be the, the have command the greatest social skill, the greatest emotional skill, right? to have that full acceptance, that full worth, that full love within yourself, just to be able to walk someone else home. You want to live that good life. You want to live that life that's not based and that your success is not based on the external. Well, let's look at developing yourself as a temple. Let's make sure that your purpose is there. Let's make sure that your purpose is not designed and divined by someone else. Let's make sure that your purpose is something that's internally generated. Let's make sure that you are de- devoid from having to judge yourself based on how grand it is, but that you are internally connected to it, whether it is because you are literally sewing jumpers, you are knitting jumpers, but you are doing it for maybe orphans somewhere, or maybe you are flipping patties 8 a.m. in a rural country town because some guy who decides that he's only going to eat meat and with a little bit of fruit and honey needs those burgers that morning. No one else could give it to him. Only you could do that. You're at 8 a.m. at Hungry Jack's. That's meaningful. You're meaningful to me. It's a story in my life. You're meaningful to me. That's meaning. Why is that meaning? Because you're helping someone. Your purpose. If your purpose is not to serve other beings, right? And I was talking to a young man about this recently at a Breathe in Peace spiritual collective event. And I was talking to him about purpose. And I asked him, you know, what is is it that gets you up? What is it that you're living for? And he said to me that, well, I know that I need to serve, but I haven't quite found what it means to truly serve. I said, what does that mean? What does it mean to truly serve? And he goes, well, you know, I know that just helping other people seems to be the thing, or serving people seems to be the thing, but I haven't found that thing that really kind of aligns with me. I'm like, okay, that's fine. That's fine. Keep working that out for yourself. Keep working that out for you, because what he's really describing there for me is that he hasn't found a vehicle that aligns with him. But at least he understands that essence about himself in which that serving is the eternal nature. Walking each other home, right? making sure that we are all, we all honor that interconnectivity between the spirits of his life spiritual essence of this world yeah so there's your purpose and that should guide everything that you do absolutely everything that you do and that should never be forsaken for not a person not a thing not an event not a moment in time do you forsake why you are here in this world who you are in this world then you have your physical yeah making sure that you have a mechanic that can live that out through life. Then you have your mental, the way that you perceive life, perceive the world, right? Trying to eliminate as much doubt, eliminate as much tomfoolery, as much blindness within yourself, that humility. Then you have your social development, just the way that you engage and care for others, really. That's what it is at the end of the day. And not only just others, but yourself, social dynamics, social development within yourself. And then all of this would be transcended by the inner knowing, the inner nature, which I always say, that inner garden, which I'm glad that we're getting to now because I actually just realizing that's something I forgot to mention in our long rant before that you will never hear. <laughs> but the inner knowing, the inner nature, I think the reason why I didn't get to that is because it's just all laid in amongst all of it. You feel all of it. That at the end of the day, we are all just illusions, facades of an ego. Right? You're all operating with your own name, but just knowing that you can transcend beyond your name, behind beyond your date of birth, your occupation. And you can realize that I am something eternal. I am something that will never be defined by words. That as I listen to Adam right now, as I listen, who's listening? Who's listening? And when you used to come to realize who's listening, that little fragment of realization, that's it. There you are. There's your enlightenment. There's your bodhisattva nature. There's your Buddha nature. There is your eternal nature. When you come to realize for a very split moment in time that I am not this, that I just am. And beneath those words, you will find the truth. Yes. So that throughout your days manifesting this temple, throughout your days helping the beings of this world, you would always remain connected to who you truly are. A transcendence of the temple itself into an inner garden that is not only the temple, 
but detached from the temple. <laughs> the inner garden is the temple. The temple is the inner garden. That's nice as well. To really bring this podcast to a summary and bring it back to Curious Boy who said, I feel like a failure because I can't get any girl. And what that really reeks to me of is your self-disconnection, your inability to get yourself. And this is where I'd have you begin. I'd have you begin by sitting down with a journal, not on your own, cut out the distraction, the distracting social media, the friends, family, et cetera, cut it all out just for a night, cut out the inflammatory stimulus, all right? Just get yourself some water, that's it. Sit down, pen and paper, journal. One question, who are you? Who are you? One question, embellish and delight in trying to answer that question. Get as close to the spiritual diamond that exists within you though. And after, med- take time to meditate through it, visualize through it, put something down, cross it out, put something else down, leave it there, whatever. Move through it. I want you to start beginning the process to healing the unresolved trauma within yourself because if you truly come to understand who you are and there is, as I said before, some darkness covering the spiritual diamond within you, that will come out as you start to answer that question. You start to realize that, or maybe the reason why I'm so heavily dependent upon the validation of females is because at some point in my life, I was told that I was unworthy. I was told that I never amount to much, that I was just a, a waste of time, a waste of energy. I wasn't worth the grain of soul from my father. I wasn't worth my mother seeing the beauty within me and the truth within me. And that's how I perceived it. Now, often that's because your mother and father were in pain themselves, generational cycle of pain. All of this will start to come out. For every single person that I've seen come through the social dynamics journey, didn't come. they may have come to it because they thought they wanted a better dating life. They thought they wanted more sexual abundance. They thought they wanted to meet their lifetime partner. They thought they wanted to create a life with someone. But really what they came for was to know themselves, was to reconnect with themselves, to come with a, a true harmony in this life, to know that they could one day rest their eyes for the final moment and look back and say, I had a good life. I had the best life. And what is the best life? It's not for me to design for you, but at least from my perspective, the best life I could possibly live is one in which that I increase the love, peace, and joy of the beings around me. I reduce the suffering. And if in one incremental micro percentage, I moved human beings a little forward and a little closer together. So curious boy, I don't want you to walk throughout the rest of your life thinking that you're a failure because you haven't got a girl in your life. I want you to realize that my success in life is not dependent upon a girl being in my life. My success in life is coming to a firm, whole, centered groundedness within me to develop myself into a being of supreme excellence, one that endeavors to give the best of experience to every single person I engage with. For I give myself that very same quality. For I had found the love within myself, I had returned to it, and so now I can give that to others. Surely the woman that you desire would seek that first in a man, that spiritual grounding. Surely the woman that you desire in your life is the one that would see that my man is a journey. That he encourages a journey within himself. He's on a path, he's on a process. He understands that he's imperfect. He understands that actually this life is much more than about his little tiny little ego. His tiny little ego is rather irrelevant. That actually I sense eternity within him. And so I would desire to share an eternity with him. If that isn't the quality that you wish to see in a woman, then I think you need to take a deep, close look at the woman you're looking for. For the woman, for the woman you are looking for will show up when you become the man that she was looking for. It's such an interesting relationship, isn't it? That the more you strive and the more you try to bring the most amazing, beautiful woman into your life, the further you get away from it. Because you lose yourself and you forsake yourself in the pursuit of external validation. And the pursuit of external validation is surely a destruction of self-worth. You are only further depleting that already very minimal resource for 
it must have been so minimal for you to even fall into such a pathway. And I do not fault you for that. It is surely not your entire wrongdoing. I'm sure that there, like, listen, this is what I'm saying. Human beings are born whole. You're born of light. You're born of love. You had to be traumatized at a certain point and there had to be pain left unresolved in order for you to believe that you were not worthy and whole enough so you had to chase external validation in the form of women, money, etc. So the healing path is there for you. The process is there for you as it is for everyone. It will not be easy. It will be the hardest thing you ever do in your life. And so the reward will be even greater. In the cave that you fear, you will find the treasure that you seek. So enter the fear and enter the cave of who you are in order to come back out to realize that you are no one and so everyone. Realizing your place in this world, realizing your short, elusive time here as a human being, you don't have forever. You don't have forever now. But that's all there really is. When you really want to boil it down, we only really have now. So, these ideas of feeling like a failure, success, very subjective. Don't worry about it. Do the things and be the person that maps to who you want to be by the time that you're dead. And if the person that you are by the time that you're dead maps anything close to someone that helped someone else improved the condition of life for someone else, I guarantee you, you will feel successful. And with that, my friend and my friends, I wish you all so much love, peace and joy. Uh, again, I just want to make apologize and make an apology here at the end for my monumental fuck up with the batteries. See, I don't know in post editing if I included just the camera audio of that part or if I decide to include this kind of uh, abbreviated re- ending, but whatever. I make mistakes like everyone else. I'm a human being and I own that. So I thank you for putting up with my mistakes, my human mistakes. <laughs> and so I send you all that love, peace, and joy. Of course, of course, deeply from within my soul this holiday season. Be with the ones that you love and honor your space and your time now. I see you. Ja. And that brings me to my thanks for all of you. Thank you, first off, for just being here, your presence. But please let me know. Let me know in a comment down below where you are in your lives, how you felt about this, any commentary. I'll do my best to get back as soon as I possibly can. And also, if you did enjoy the content, please hit the thumbs up on the YouTube video. It just helps it get sent out to more people in the community. And if you feel like this would resonate with someone else, please share it to some of your close friends. If you would like to dive into one-on-one coaching, that's all available on boldojo.com. Guided meditation. Free resources of wisdom. Free weekly on my newsletter, Bowl Sip. Chuck your email in. Comes out every Friday. That's all available. All the links down below. And if you would like to support the podcast directly, you can donate anything that you wish through the PayPal link down below or on the website, boldojo.com in the podcast section. Anything that you guys give is always super appreciated. So thank you very much. Wishing you all the love, peace, and joy in this life. <laughs>